Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Morillo and I'm from the Bronx. Um, I'm very proud to say that I'm from the Bronx and I still live in the Bronx. Um, the reason I say this is because in almost every single professional environment that I've worked in, I've been one of few women of color, one of a handful of, of um, native New Yorkers working here in New York, and certainly maybe one or two people from the Bronx, excluding people from the cleaning staff. In working in tech, um, I find that there are a lot of assumptions about people like me. I'm supposed to be exceptional because I'm from the Bronx and I'm working at a job here in New York that doesn't involve cleaning. Um, and certainly, as somebody like myself who's an aspiring developer, I feel that at every turn, even without being told that there are no developers in the Bronx, sometimes people flat out say there are no developers in the Bronx. Um, I actually had um, a situation, I work at General Assembly, um, and I used to produce one of our courses, and I invited some developers to come and talk to our students about working as developers, and one person told me that, um, and he told the entire class that, you know what, there are no developers in the Bronx, and everyone laughed, and I thought that was really funny, um, and not in a good way, but I thought that it was really interesting that he would say that, because the only reason I see myself in tech today is because a fellow Dominican from the Bronx taught himself how to code, he taught me how to code. So um, I usually come against, up against a lot of people who make assumptions about why people like me from low-income communities, people of color, don't go into programming. And um, well, some of the things that I feel like I hear is that there's no interest. People of color aren't really interested. They don't really flat out say that, right, because racism is subtle today. But um, that's basically what people are insinuating, and I actually find that really interesting. I mean, I know that apparently, from what I'm told, you know, assumptions, um, if you weren't programming from the age of 12 on, then apparently you really don't have any business being in tech. Well, I have news for you. When I was 12 years old, I was, it was 1998, I got on America Online. I was a fan of NSYNC and the Spice Girls, and I decided, you know what, they don't really have good websites, so I'm gonna create a website, and I'm gonna be the go-to resource for NSYNC and the Spice Girls. So I started creating a website, so I created websites, and each single Spice Girl had her own page, and guess what, I linked all of those pages up, and they were all looking real nice and flashy in their HTML backgrounds, and I had tags, so you couldn't steal my pictures, but I would steal my pictures from you, guess what? <laughs> That was the extent of it. I didn't go beyond that because as far as I was concerned, there was nothing behind the curtain. When I saw the curtain, I also saw a window, and I thought that the window was also the world beyond the window. Because growing up, we didn't have career day in the schools that I went to, and the only professionals that I knew of were educators and maybe nurses. My dad went to school, in, my parents are from the Dominican Republic, and my dad grew up in a very poor family. He taught himself, well, he maybe didn't teach himself much, but he, um, he became an engineer um, in the Dominican Republic, it took him seven years to graduate from the top school in the Dominican Republic, only to come to the United States to basically create opportunities for his children and found himself working as a mechanic. So there was nobody around to really tell me, you know what, Stephanie, you have some skills, you could really do stuff. Because growing up, we were also taught, and we also assumed that if you weren't taught in science and math, that you really had no business doing anything regarding anything science and math, right? Um, I, I went to a really good high school here in New York City, and even then, I found that nobody was there really to guide me. In fact, from communities where I'm from, like the community that I'm from, you'll see that if you're a really smart and gifted kid, whatever smart and gifted means, um, you're basically left to your own devices to find these opportunities that'll help you grow. You won't have somebody grabbing you by the hand and saying, hey, guess what, you can be a developer, and this is what being a developer is. When I was 18, I went to a top university here in the US, and um, I was surprised when there were people who came up to me, freshmen, and were like, I want to be a chemical engineer. And I'm like, well, that's sweet. I really don't know what that means. Because we had no career day, we didn't know anything about engineering, and we were told that if you weren't good in math and science, you really had no business doing anything in math and science -y, right? In fact, it wasn't until I was 25, by then a college graduate, a Fulbright scholar, well-read, well-traveled, well-cultured, that I knew what a developer was. My mentor, the person who taught me how to code, Stephen, his own wife, didn't know what he did. She thought he was responsible for creating buttons on websites until she took a web development class. So um, I want to go back to the topic of interest. A few months ago, I had the honor of speaking to young high school girls through, who were taking a summer programming class through the organization Girls Who Code. And this organization, um, you know, they're, they're trying to get young girls interested in STEM with the hopes that they will go into uh, CS fields and you know become developers and basically the engineers that we really desperately need today. I was really pleased to find that over 75% of the girls were also girls of color, and a lot of them were from communities like mine, the Bronx. We had some girls from Brownsville, some girls from Jamaica, basically low-income communities here in New York. 
And one of the girls who's from the Bronx asked me, you know, how do I get people interested in tech? She says, I, I, you know, I didn't know what tech was or programming was before I came here, but now I know and I want to show people. Well, there's a two-part answer to that, but I gave her a, a more simplified version of the first part, which I will tell you, and it has to do with relatability. I think that in my experience in tech, the tech industry has done a terrible job at being relatable to people. I mean, the first thing is, when you use language like Jedis and ninjas and magic and disruption and sexy, to describe the fact that you're responsible for creating a login form <laughs> on your clients. Okay, leave the ninjas out of it, pull back the curtain, and then show them what the code base looks like. Because you know what? For a lot of us consumers and users in tech, right, we take a lot of things for granted. But it's because of engineers and designers who think about what intuition means and have broken it down to an art and a science. I don't have to think about that, so why don't you show them that? So I told her, you know what? Why don't you pull up your phone and show them Facebook? Why don't you just show them Tumblr? Why don't you show them Twitter? And then show them a command line, and then show them how to create a blog on the command line. Show them what the command line is, what it means. It looks really matrixy. We've all seen it in the yeah. matrix. That's as much command line as I ever had, right? Um, so why don't you show them that? That's one way of making it relatable. Another thing that I found was interesting, I was the only non-engineer who was invited to speak to the girls at Girls Who Code. Um, I'm an aspiring developer, but I'm not a developer myself, not yet anyway. Um, and I told them, you know, it's okay to use your programming skills and apply them in different career fields. Now I know, I know, we definitely want women and people of color to become engineers. So when we teach people programming skills, we want them eventually to become engineers, no doubt. I'm all for that. However, I don't think that it's fair to discourage young people from pursuing the interests that they really care about. And not just that, we don't, why don't we just tell them how to use programming to do better at their jobs, right? Here are some examples. I told them, well, let's say you go into marketing, right? Maybe you can be the person in charge of your company's blog, right? You can use HTML to be the person, you know, you can maintain the HTML CSS, right? Okay, cool. Or maybe you can go into email marketing, and guess what? Email marketers have to build a lot of their templates. They use HTML for that. Or let's go even simpler than that. Maybe you're somebody who's doing data entry and you have to pour over Excel spreadsheets someday. Then why don't you create a script and automate it? Done. There you go. That's one way you can use programming. Or you can become a technical writer if you're really interested in um, writing, right? We take for granted the manuals and the FAQ sections on Squarespace and documentation, but guess what? Somebody had to write that. And somebody with both programming experience and the ability to communicate properly. Speaking of which, a lot of libraries and gems, y'all can get some technical writers to rewrite your documentation because they don't always make a lot of sense. That's one thing, right? <laughs> You could become a publicist for a big tech firm, right? When you're a publicist for a tech firm, you're responsible for communicating the product and pitching it to journalists who work in the tech beat. If you know what that product does, you'll be a better communicator, and you know what? Hey, you might get your company some press. Or you can become a technical recruiter. Different companies need uh, developers that work in different stacks, engineers that work in different stacks. If you know a bit of programming and you really understand the intricacies of what it is that your company is looking for, you can work in that way. So I think that we can't, I think that we shouldn't forget when we're trying to get people interested in programming and in tech, that it's more than just engineers and designers that are involved in tech. We have people doing operations and processes and business development and all of them benefit from knowing a little bit of programming. And I'm not just saying that for the sake of saying that. I work in marketing in my job and the reason they moved me over was because I know how to program. So the second part of that, act, that answer um, about how to get people interested in tech from areas like mine I would reckon that it has to do with access. Now, what do I mean by access? Well, tech really likens itself to an egalitarian system, right? Like, we have all this great, and it's true, yeah, there's a lot of great information online, there's open source technology, there's stuff you can download for free, right? But you know what, there's a lot of assumptions that are made. You need internet connection, and you also need unbridled access to a computer. And not just that, certain technologies require certain operating systems for you to even access that. So, well, let's say you're in an area where you have internet access and computers, um, or let's say you don't, let's say you don't have that readily available at home. You might say, well, what about schools? Well, a lot of schools, especially in low-income communities, they don't always have computers, and if they have computers, they don't always have the latest versions. They don't have the, the newest Macs, they don't have the newest PCs, and they certainly might not have the latest uh, 
the latest versions of um, all the other dependencies that you need to, to, to create a development environment. Um, and sometimes those, you know, the, the libraries and schools and, and regular libraries, they only give you a certain amount of time to be able to do this. So what I'm saying is, if tech is really serious about getting people interested, then I think that the industry as a whole should really fight to make sure that everyone has access to internet, the internet and that everyone has access to a computer of some sort. And not just that, to make sure that um, we account for the different kinds of operating systems and technologies that people are using so that we can get, we can maximize the amount of people that come into tech. I also want to talk really briefly about diversity. I know that's like a hot button word. Everybody's always saying diversity, diversity, diversity. Well, what do I really think diversity is? Diversity, I think, um, in short, when it relates to the tech industry, has to do with removing one point of view from the center and allowing all different other points of views equal access and equal opportunity and equal attention, okay? What does that mean? Well, I'm, what I'm saying is that, you know, and I know that, that, that white boys seem to be the scapegoat, but you know what, I'm gonna use y'all because y'all are the face of tech, right? So what I'm saying is that we cannot depend on white boys who work in startups in Soho to be the ones responsible for knowing every single problem that's out there and then expect them to create the solutions to it, right? Because there are things that they don't experience that they can then not know we need something for. Like what I'm saying basically is all the, the technology we have out there, all of the websites, all of the web applications, all of the things that we talk about that tech can solve, it does not represent the totality of what humanity is capable of because most people don't have access to that. What you see, what you interact with right now is based from a very, very narrow scope of um, perspective. That's basically, so I'll give you, you know what, let's go back to relatability and I'll give you an example to that. So LO, everybody's talking about LO, the new social media, um, the new social media networking site um, that's positioning itself as an anti-Facebook, right? Well, LO is in beta right now, which is to say, you know, that a lot of features haven't been rolled out, so you know, something doesn't work, my bad, we're working on it. Okay, cool, that's fair. No, that's fair, that's fair. But something that was interesting to know was that a lot of users, beta users, were complaining because there was no block feature in LO. Think about that for a minute. The founders of LO didn't think that it would be worthwhile in the beta version to have a block button. Well, I'll tell you something. I interact a lot online, especially with other women of color, and I'm gonna tell you on Twitter, block button is my favorite feature <laughs> because there is a lot of abuse, there's a lot of harassment. But you know what? If there had been people with other points of view on that team, maybe they would have thought twice about not including that in their beta version, okay? So that's how I feel about that. So um, again, with diversity, I think that we in tech have to strive to create safe and supportive spaces. Um, I think like, for example, what we've done here um, at AlterConf with all gender bathrooms, um, being very mindful of, of your language and of the things that you're saying to make it a safe and supportive space, I don't feel that tech is a safe and supportive space yet. But if you're really trying to become diverse, you really need to have a mini powwow with yourself, with your company, with everyone, and make sure that the culture that you're promoting um, is not one that uh, is exclusive and will exclude people and be off-putting to people. So in closing, I wanna, see, I wanna say that the tech industry needs to make sure that it is relatable, um, that it doesn't hide behind all of this fluffy language, that it is very clear about the things that it does and what the objectives of it are, so people have a frame of reference. Um, it should fight for equal access for everyone when it comes to internet and computer access. Um, it must create safe and supportive environments. Um, and the last thing I want to say, um, definitely for people who have clout in tech, um, I don't want to be seen because I'm from the Bronx and because I speak a certain way and because I'm a woman of color, I don't want to be seen as somebody special or an exception to the rule or like a magical unicorn at my job because this is my city. I was born and raised here. Why aren't there more people like me working in places where I work, right? Um, and I think, and I argue that by hiring more people in places like where I'm from, you're gonna have different perspectives on your products. Maybe you will build better products because there's things that you cannot think of because of your personal experience that people like me can. So I would say instead of looking at a place like the Bronx, um, where you know it is known for um, being low income or not good schools or being crime ridden or the fact that we don't have like an excellent selection of restaurants on Seamless. Instead of looking at the Bronx like that, how about you look at the Bronx as an incubator for solutions to problems that you don't even know exist yet? Thank you.